Back when I was an anesthesiology resident at the Mount Sinai Hospital, the first stop that I made every day was the operating room pharmacy where I asked for a long list of controlled medications, including fentanyl, remifentanyl, midazolam, and whatever else I thought that I might need to administer to patients that day. But there is so much more that goes on in the pharmacy than simply dispensing medications to anesthesiologists. And today we have the opportunity to sit down with a real live pharmacist and talk about what goes on behind this restricted access door. My name is Marina Morjikian. I am a pharmacist uh, registered in New York State. I have been working for Mount Sinai Hospital for the last 34 years. So when I come to the hospital at the beginning of the day, and I ask for fentanyl, remifentanyl, hydromorphone, maybe ketamine, and some other medications that I anticipate needing during the day. The sense that I have is that it's just ready to go and all I need is for a pharmacist to put it in a bag and hand it to me. But I imagine it's more complicated than that. Can you give me an inside look into what exactly goes on in the pharmacy to dispense controlled substances to anesthesiologists who will then provide it to their patients? The first thing that we generally address and uh, we discuss during huddles is do we have any shortages of any kind? And generally, anesthesia department and pharmacy department work together to figure out how to handle a particular shortage. The one that I remember that was most significant was uh, we're out of fentanyl 20 and fentanyl 5 ml. So for cardiac cases, you need a lot of fentanyl. So we look for different alternatives and the pharmacy department found sufentanyl. And the question is, can sufentanyl be used instead of the fentanyl 20? And the answer was yes. A lot of hospitals have a Pixis in the operating room for the anesthesiologist to get medications from. I think there are some advantages that come to that, namely convenience, but there are also disadvantages. If I have a question about a medication, I can't ask a Pixis anything, and I don't know if you've tried using ChatGPT, but I can't really reliably ask ChatGPT anything about medicine anyways. So a major advantage is that if I have a question about pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, or even something about economics of a medication, how much it costs, and I want to build that into my practice of anesthesiology, what are some of the advantages that you see to having the interface that we have between pharmacy and anesthesiology where Many other institutions just have a Pixis that's present and there's really not a face-to-face -face interaction between the two departments. After I give out the medications, there generally may be a question or a conversation or uh, some sort of odd event that happened with a medication. And I pay attention and I listen and I see if I can do something about it. So an odd event that happened in our institution was the reports from several different anesthesiologists, that the remifentanil, the brand name that they were using, was not working as it was supposed to. So I went to my manager and then we went to the safety officer of the department. And in conclusion, it was decided by using an outside lab that the remifentanil, it was diluted with plasmolite. And plasmolite caused to lose the effectiveness, 40% of the drug effectiveness with plasmolite. So the Department of Anesthesia and the Department of Pharmacy were re-educated to use normal saline as it is mentioned by the drug manufacturer. And normal saline was made available in all the operating room. And since then, we did not have any more complaints. Because we are talking about controlled substances and other substances that have a high potential for abuse, and we're also talking about a specialty, namely anesthesiology, where there is documented evidence that abuse of controlled substances is higher than uh, many other fields in medicine. One of the paramount concerns is making sure um, that these drugs don't end up in places where they shouldn't go, namely being diverted um, or abused by anyone. Can you tell me a little bit about the safety mechanisms um, that pharmacy has in place to make sure that basically everyone is safe in handling these medications getting to patients? When we receive a kit back from an anesthesiologist, the first part of the reconciling is to make sure that what we gave, what was indicated at use, and the waste that was returned, it's all recorded on the form that you receive with your medications. Once that's done, we 
go over and we check that the waste that you have in ML is present. A second pharmacist stops to check us to make sure that we have initialed and actually what's physically there and physically written is present and they can't assign us. So we have a double check system. So if you say that you used one Madaz and we look at it, it shows that you use half, not a full vial, then we're gonna ask you, well, what happened? Because your Epic record says something else. So we make a correction um, and you have a chance to review. Uh, you may find a half CC of Madaz somewhere in your bag or you may say, oh my goodness, my attending gave the other half and I wasn't aware and the records are corrected. So everybody's verified. The drug testing that we do, which is random, as well as the auditing that we do, which is also random, um, every month is put in a report and those reports are sent to the leadership of anesthesia department and the leadership of pharmacy department. All the medications that come to us as waste, they're handled uh, with care and they're all drained and then they placed in the sharps container. So there's no waste anywhere available to anyone. If there is an irregularity, which, you know, medication errors happen, sometimes people dispense more or less than they intended to and, and those irregularities are reflected in the records and the checks that you do. I think historically at some institutions that would be handled more in a punitive way where someone would get in trouble, uh, but the trend I think more recently has been to make sure that everybody who's involved is okay and that there aren't um, safety matters um, that, that need further investigation. I must say that I agree. And I believe one of the advantages of having a live pharmacist that knows you, that would notice if you have red eyes or you acting strangely or you're asking, you know, you're having a general surgery case and you're asking for fentanyl 20 mLs, would make me question what's going on. I would probably be specifically drug testing you and auditing your returns. I would mention my concerns to the leadership of anesthesia and will follow much more closely what is going on. Generally, from what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, Feinstein, Apixis cannot do that. We've spent a lot of time talking about controlled medications that are dispensed from the pharmacy, but there are also many other medications that are not controlled that are already available to anesthesiologists in the operating room. Pharmacy plays a very large role in stocking those trays in the operating rooms. Can you tell me about what goes into the preparation of these trays? Primarily uh, in the GP3OR satellite, we prepare those kits. We label all the medications with a specific label that is recognized by the kit check machine. So all the medications that are placed in the trays, the trays design and what medication go in are not decided just by pharmacy. There's collaboration with the anesthesia providers, what medications and about how many vials of their medication are necessary for a particular surgery, for a particular tray. Right now we have about three different trays for three different kind of surgeries. We're gonna be adding two more. So we wanna be very specific to make sure that the providers have all the medications that they need. Those trays are returned every 24 hours and replenished and resend out. And the kit check machine uh, helps us check to make sure that the medication that's supposed to be in there is in there and also generates a sheet to describe all the medication, the strength and the quantities that should be in the tray. This process saves the hospital. We used to be over budget, at least $4 million. We are ensuring that the medication that you have is in date and we're constantly maintaining the stock and making sure that we order enough and uh, what you have, you have everything that you need. What is the potential harm to patients if a medication does run out of date? The absolute truth is nothing. Uh, there's some loss of potency, but we have to keep up to, to standards that are in all the hospitals for medication safety. So if a product is said to expire, then we remove it because we don't want to take a chance that 10, 20, 30% effectiveness is lost. I'm exaggerating. It's, it's generally like a 
two or three percent that effectiveness that is lost but we don't want to start using medications that are considered beyond use. It's my understanding that pharmacy is involved with a lot of the compounding of medications that we administer to patients. I don't know anything about what that process looks like. Can you tell me what sort of compounding do you do for the medications that we administer? We have a whole department uh, that we call IV manufacturing and the people in IV manufacturing, they batch, so they do a large number of bags. So for instance, all our phenylephrines, the, the bags that you take out every day, they are made in IV manufacturing and they do a, a between 150 to 200 bags a day. It's a process that's very specific and we make sure that it's sterile and everything is done according to the standards that are set in place, which are very high. In the operating room pharmacy, in this pharmacy, we have a hood where we can, we can uh, compound products. I'm curious about phenylephrine in particular because this is a medication that we administer to patients very routinely. Why is it the case that phenylephrine is compounded here as opposed to being something that I would just draw up um, from a vial in my medication cart in the operating room? All the safety and sterility that we have in place right now is because there have been errors made in other hospitals where for whatever reason there was contamination, wrong drug was given, uh, wrong dose was given, uh, and all those because they were not controlled. Either it was an emergency or just an error of the nurse, of the physician. Right, because when we're talking about a medication like phenylephrine, which is a very potent vasopressor, there are formulations of 10 milligrams in one milliliter, which is an extraordinarily concentrated amount, which if administered in error, depending on the patient, could result in very serious injury. So it's fascinating that we have the system in place, and one that I'm very grateful for, um, where we ultimately make it safer um, to administer a medication like uh, phenylephrine. I agree 100%. Before I started residency, I had no sense of the fact that there are pharmacists who have different areas in which they work. And so for someone to hear something like an operating room pharmacy, I think would be new for a lot of people. Can you help me understand just from a, a 40,000 foot view, what are the different places in which pharmacists can practice? There are primarily four different areas of practice. Uh, one would be the community pharmacy, which everybody's aware, like CVS, Walgreens, and such. Then you have the hospital pharmacy, uh, in which you can be staff, like I am. You are a clinical, but you consider staff. Uh, you have managers, uh, and you have clinical pharmacists who primarily are part of the rounding teams. Then you have the industry, Primarily, you're becoming an independent researcher. And finally, you have academia, which is you do some clinical rotations. Uh, maybe you specialize uh, clinically, but then you go and you start working for university and you're a professor and your impact is teaching the generations coming up. If someone wants to become a pharmacist in the United States, once they finish high school, what does the training path look like to get to where you are right now? So right now is four years of undergraduate and two years of pharmacy school. During pharmacy school, you, uh, it, it includes intern hours. Um, and then after you finished the schooling part, you take a licensing exam. We have pharmacy residency, but it's not a requirement. Uh, so pharmacy residency in the United States, you have 2,500 spots available and you have 12,000 uh, pharmacists who apply for this 2,500 spots. So it's very, very competitive. What are the different residencies that are available? Uh, residencies, you have oncology, emergency room, pediatrics. Also in the hospital, we have emergency room pharmacists. We have critical care, pediatric pharmacists. So we have it specialized. And generally, uh, a clinical pharmacist with a residency uh, in pediatrics will be working in pediatrics and from there they can work as staff or if there are opportunities and there are always opportunities in the hospitals you can go into the clinical and just round and create policies and educate the staff and stuff like that. The whole process that you have walked me through about 
medication dispensation, how you make sure that what's in the operating room is what we think that it is and that it's up to date and everything that you do is an incredible operation. I really appreciate the opportunity to walk through the restricted access door and get a peek into what life is like as a pharmacist and I just really appreciate the services that you offer and most of all thanks for your time and sitting for this interview. My pleasure. Einstein. For our next collaboration do you think that we could do a reaction video to something pharmacy related? I know Glock and Flecken for example has a slew of what I think are hilarious videos that pertain to pharmacy. I'm curious to know what your reaction would be to these videos. Should we do that next? Yeah we could. We could.